And good evening. My name is Nestor Matthews. I'm a psychology professor at Denison University, and I'm happy to welcome you to Blowing Off STEAM. STEAM is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. We meet on Zoom at 7 p.m. on the second Tuesday of each month during the school year. Blowing Off STEAM is a collaboration among three educational institutions, the Granville Public Library, the Ohio State University at Newark, and Denison University. My co-organizers on the Blowing Off STEAM series are Lucy Chin Parker from the Granville Public Library. Welcome, Lucy, and thank you for putting us together tonight. And Professor Mike Stamatikos from the Department of Physics at OSU in Newark. Mike is also the founder of the series. So welcome, Mike, and thank you for founding our series. Looking ahead to our next Blowing Off STEAM session, we hope you will join us at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, October 11. Our session will focus on the marching arts, specifically Drum Corps International. Our speaker will be Genevieve Geisler, Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operating Officer of the world-class drum corps known as the Blue Coats, who are headquartered in Akron, Ohio. During that session, Genevieve will share her experiences as Chair of INSTEP, Drum Corps International's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Initiative. Again, that's at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, October 11, on Zoom. As always, the Zoom coordinates will be available through the Granville Public Library. And now for tonight's main event. It's my great pleasure to introduce Sullivan Ray, who comes to us tonight from Chicagoland, where she's currently working at the Morningstar Development Program. Sullivan is a recent Denison University alum, graduating just this past May as a psychology major and a Spanish major. While at Denison, Sullivan played an active role in Denison's Mindfulness Club, and tonight she will share some mindfulness research that she conducted at Denison with her co-authors, Denison psychology professor Bob Weiss and fellow student Tema Cohen, a psychology major from the Denison class of 2021. Tonight, Sullivan's talk is titled Mindfulness and COVID-Related Stress and Anxiety. Sullivan, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Hi, yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for, for being here and for taking the time out of your busy evenings to listen to my presentation. Um, I'm very excited to be here, and I also wanted to thank Dr. Matthews for reaching out. Um, I'm so honored, and thank you to Lucy and Mike as well um, for having me. Um, I'm very excited, and it's great to see some familiar faces um, from Denison. I really do miss it already. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for, um, for being here. And I'm really mostly excited to, to talk about, to, about mindfulness. I'm very passionate about it. And I think it's a very pertinent topic of conversation um, in our current society and also um, specific, specifically since the onset of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And that is what my research focuses on. So um, just to, to start us off here, let's see. So I just wanted to ask you all and kind of get the discussion going um, about what you think mindfulness is. And when you hear the word mindfulness, what, what comes to your mind? And um, yeah, just what do you think of? We can invite people to unmute if you're so inclined. Anybody would like to unmute and take a, a shot at Sullivan's question? Uh, I could take a stab at it. Um, I think in my mind, mindfulness is about like understanding your emotions and taking time to like be aware of like what's affecting you in the world. Uh, it's like mental well being in a sense. Yeah, that was great. That's great. Does anyone else? Be, thank you for, yeah. for participating. Do, does yeah, anyone else have any ideas as well? Feel free to unmute. We're all very informal here. If we've got a shy audience, maybe I'll, I'll offer the way I think about mindfulness. Something like mindfulness is paying attention to present moment experience without judgment. Yes. Yeah, that's pretty much, yeah, spot on. Um, does, does anyone um, want to share an experience or a task in which they've engaged and where they've, in which they felt mindful? Um, it looks like you've lost all track of time and have been very present and aware. Does anyone want to share an activity that they've participated in, which they've experienced this? Or if not, that's okay. Um, I feel like, for example, I, I play tennis a lot and I feel like when I'm on the tennis court, I'm very um, engaged and active and kind of losing all track of time. Um, it's just an example. Um, but 
to move on here. So mindfulness essentially has two main, um, two primary components here. Um, the first one is being present in the moment. So what Dr. Matthews um, pretty much already said, um, this includes being aware of your surroundings um, and being in tune to your senses. Um, so what you're hearing, tasting, smelling, seeing, um, and also being aware of your thoughts and feelings. So um, being cognizant of what's going through your mind, how you're feeling. And then um, the second primary component of mindfulness is the non-judgmental acceptance of the self. Um, and I think this is a very crucial component that sometimes tends to be overlooked. Um, and I'm guilty of this as well um, when practicing mindfulness. Um, I think that when you are experiencing thoughts and feelings, whether this be positive um, or negative, if you're stressed about an exam or, or you're worried about a social interaction you had or, or something of this sort, um, you can't be hard on yourself um, for, for thinking in that way um, or feeling a certain way. I mean, you just kind of have to acknowledge those thoughts and feelings and just let them pass rather than um, being hard on yourself. So definitely those two um, primary components play into um, kind of the concept of, of mindfulness. Um, and so just to kind of talk about how I got into mindfulness, I um, started dealing with a lot of anxiety in, in high school and I started to do yoga classes. Um, and I think that was when I was first introduced to the, the concept of, of being present and, and um, being aware. Um, but I wasn't formally introduced to the concept of mindfulness until I took an abnormal psychology course with Dr. Weiss um, my sophomore year um, of college in which I studied the concept more formally um, and researched it as well. And so, yeah, and then I got, this is really where my, my passion was sparked. Um, and and um, now obviously as uh, um, Dr. Matthew said, I was involved in the mindfulness club and a lot of other programs at Denison. Um, so he, that was just kind of an overview of mindfulness for, for those of you who may not be familiar with the term. Um, but here is my research poster. Um, just it's, I'm gonna use it kind of as a, a roadmap for my presentation to kind of talk about um, my research project, the purpose, uh, method, results, um, and discussion. And I conducted this research in 2020 um, alongside Tema Cohen, um, who is a Denison graduate of 2021 and Dr. Weiss. Um, and we were originally scheduled to, to gather the data in the spring semester um, of my sophomore year in 2020. Um, and then we were um, scheduled to do um, like formulate the research paper and um, do run statistical tests and analyses during that summer as a part of the summer scholars program um, at Denison. And so obviously um, in 2020, that plan was really shaken up um, with the onset of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. However, despite that transition um, to online format, um, we were able to continue um, our study. And actually, the, the pandemic, um, kind of a silver lining, um, provided uh, an, an environment in which anxieties and stress, were, they were at an all-time high for, for students specifically and, and for all individuals in the world. Um, and so this um, pandemic, we kind of reframed our, our um, question a little bit and looked at specifically how mindfulness can help students cope with COVID-19 related stress and anxiety. So that's kind of where um, the project originated. Um, and so for the purpose, um, as we all can attest, um, the students out there um, facing, a, we all face a considerable amount of, of pressure managing the responsibilities of uh, post-secondary education. And then the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic obviously brought a plethora of new challenges to us in that spring of 2020, um, including um, health concerns, job cancellations, isolation, um, the transition to remote learning and going back home. Um, so all of those are important to take into consideration when thinking of um, what was going on during this time. Um, and so we wanted to determine whether a mindfulness program known as Koru Mindfulness, which I will get into that kind of in the next slide, the specifics of the program, um, would help mitigate the stress um, that was accompanied um, by these unprecedented times um, for college students. Um, and so students were assigned um, to a core group or to a waitlist control um, condition prior to the onset of the pandemic. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, but so we hypothesized that students who were assigned to the core group would show better post-treatment outcomes than the controls um, and that these treatment gains would be maintained at follow-up 
um, and that increased mindfulness would, would mediate the relationship between treatment um, and students' outcomes. And I'll kind of go into what those mean a little bit more. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the purpose here. And then if anyone has any questions or, or comments, feel free to kind of interject. I don't want it to be super formal if anyone wants to say or ask a question or anything. Um, so for the method here, um, we have our participants. There were 32 undergraduate students, all from Denison. Um, as you can see, um, primarily female, um, enrolled in two psychology research courses. Um, so this is kind of a quasi uh, experimental design where we had one um, psychology research class um, all participate in the KORU program and then the other course um, were assigned to the um, no treatment control condition. Um, and then all the participants were between 19 and 21 years old. Um, and so the procedure, so this is, um, to talk about the Coral Mindfulness Program itself. So as I previously stated, it is a mindfulness group-based um, intervention designed specifically for um, college students and specifically for individuals in this um, sort of emerging adult um, stage of, of life. Um, and so the, the program is different than other typical mindfulness programs in that it's shorter in duration. Um, so there are only four um, 75 minute sessions, um, and it's a very low level of commitment. Um, for example, it's on a Tuesday night, you come and um, participate in your instructor in the group. Um, you just kind of talk about um, mindfulness and your experiences. Um, it's also very interactive. You're encouraged to kind of share um, your experience and how um, these activities are making you feel. Um, and so it's also a nice way to kind of ground yourself and reset um, your week and kind of reset your intention and just set up time in your schedule to breathe. Um, so it's, it's a very great program. Um, and so in each of the four sessions, they're um, designated to different activities. So the first um, focuses on breathing. Um, and I think this is essentially, to me, it's one of the more important um, sessions out of the whole program because breath is something that is constant um, in our lives and like an ever-changing world essentially so whenever things go wrong you know, the one thing you can rely on is your breath um, and so that's something that I think about a lot and so that first session kind of focuses on belly breathing and body scans and dynamic breathing um, and how that can um, uh, help you kind of reduce your stress and anxiety and, and be present. Um, and the second one um, focused on walking and Gotha meditation. And Gotha meditation um, is essentially, it's, it's like poetry almost and focusing on the words and how words can be used in a mindful way um, to kind of ground yourself. So grounding yourself in those words instead of in your breath, like in the first um, session. And the third session focuses on guided imagery. Um, and labeling, letting go of thoughts. And then the final session focuses on mindful eating, um, which is really interesting. And then um, labeling and letting go of those emotions. Um, and so as you can see, these the activities that are included in the sessions. They're all pretty much part of our daily lives. We all breathe, walk, and eat. And so it's just, it's, it's not a lot to incorporate mindfulness into your life. It's kind of just a way to reframe the way you think and function and being more present and kind of slowing down. Um, and so that's kind of what um, the program um, is focused on. And it kind of shows you that you can implement these mindful practices in, outside of the program. Um, itself. And so um, for the measures we used, um, we utilized various questionnaires that pertain to different um, phenomena. Here we looked at mindfulness, um, self-compassion, um, gratitude, sleep, stress, anxiety, and attention, um, just to look at kind of overall functioning. And so uh, the students, both the students in the core group group and also in the no treatment control um, all took the um, these questionnaires three times they took them once um, at week two prior this was prior to the onset of the pandemic so just kind of baseline um, and then weeks three through six were the core roof sessions for the one group so they would take um, once a week they would go and do their session and then on week seven they would take the questionnaires again and see um, at post-treatment how they were feeling. And then this was also um, important to note that it was really at the height um, of COVID on campus. And then finally, they were assessed again at week 14, um, which is the follow-up measure. And that was conducted remotely when students were all um, sent home. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we um, based um, 
our data were um, and used um, these questionnaires. Um, so it's important to note. And then, um, but for the sake of um, time in this presentation, we're only gonna be focusing on the measures of stress, anxiety, and mindfulness, of course. Um, okay, so for the results here, did CORU actually improve students' functioning during the COVID-19 crisis? Um, and the short answer is yes, it did. And um, here we can look at the different figures we have on the screen. Um, if we look at the first figure, 1A, um, this kind of shows the mindfulness scores that I was talking about at um, pre-treatment, post-treatment, and follow-up. And if you look at the red line here, the red line displays um, the scores of the CORU the mean score of the uh, CORU group. Um, and so as you can see at pre-treatment, um, they were below actually the, the control group. And then at post-treatment, which is right after they can finish completing the CORU program, um, they had significantly um, increased compared to the control group. And then what's really interesting at that is that these treatment gains were maintained at that follow-up at week 14 as well. Um, as you can see the red line, um, is significantly, statistic, statistically significantly higher than um, that blue line. And then if we look at figure 1B and 1C, this looks at stress and anxiety. Um, again, the red line also is still displaying the CORU um, group's mean score. Um, and it's the same kind of thing, just in the opposite direction. Um, those stress and anxiety scores are lower um, than the control group at post-treatment and um, at follow-up, which is, um, really incredible um, and, and great results. It's really exciting to see that this actually had an impact here. Um, and then let's see. So we also conducted um, a mediation test um, to determine the theoretical mechanism by which CORU helped students cope with COVID-19 related um, distress. Um, and so why? Um, the individuals in the CORU group showed better results. Um, and so the results indicate that that need, can you all hear me still? Hello? You all hear me? Okay. Okay, good. I just got a message. You're, you're okay, I just got a message that my internet connection was unstable. So I just wanted to check. Thank you. I think um, you're okay. It cut out just for a second, but I think you're okay. And I think we're all with you on these mediation models. So and that's great. I think, yeah. Okay. Good, yeah. So um, essentially, to, to kind of sum it up, the uh, um, CORU program um, showed increased mindfulness in students, and then that increased mindfulness then predicted lower stress and lower anxiety, um, which is pretty cool. And then um, for the discussion here, um, so as I as we just saw in um, the graphs and also what I said, the, the CORU increased students' ability to cope um, with increased stress, anxiety, and um, sleep problems as well compared um, to the controls. And the increased mindfulness mediated the relationship um, between treatment um, condition and student stress and anxiety outcomes. Um, and also just for the future, um, I think that we should look at the ability of CORU booster sessions. So such as the CORU 2.0, there is a second program um, in the CORU curriculum um, to see how programs such as that would help maintain treatment gains over time, like longer than that 14 week um, period. Um, and so that would be really interesting to examine. Um, and also these results are very interesting because the participants were actual Denison students, um, like a lot of you all, which is really um, impactful, I think, to have these significant findings on a small campus like us. It makes it so much more realistic and also um, displays the implications that mindfulness can have um, on people's lives. So I think it's really cool that we have this study based on students just like us, and also um, I would like to know, I personally have participated in the CORU Mindfulness um, Program prior to conducting this research. Um, I participated with um, Phoebe Bentley um, many, I guess, two or three years ago now. Um, and I personally saw a lot of benefits that it brought into my life, just dealing with the daily stressors that accompanied uh, college life at the time. Um, it just keeps you grounded when you feel like life is, is just kind of getting out of control. Um, and so I also know that many Denison faculty and staff are um, licensed in the CORU program, um, and they are offering these courses to Denison students. Um, I know uh, Susie Kalinowski, 
um, is um, actually doing one right now um, at Denison. Um, and then um, I know Dr. Henshaw is also licensed. And then um, Dr. Matthews, are you are you as well? Um, Thank you, Sullivan. I'm actually in process, so I've got most of my okay. requirements done, and I need to uh, I, I need to talk with Jack Wheeler and some others, and and wrestle up a few more students for my next couple of sessions, and then I'll be certified. But I'm most of them a little more than half of the way through my certification. So uh, yeah, and I think we have some other. I think I see some names of folks here that that might be either certified or in that process. So uh, it's pretty pervasive on campus, and I think it's becoming more pervasive across college campuses more generally. It's not just a Denison thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would agree. Um, and so definitely take advantage of those if um, you are able to. I think it, it's wonderful. And as I said, it's very low commitment. Um, but also to Dr. Matthew's point, I feel like <clears throat> just in the time in which I conducted this research um, in 2020, I feel like Denison has grown so much um, in promoting mindfulness on campus and kind of supporting um, the greater cause to, to, to help students be more mindful. And so that's really cool to to see, um, and I know we were just talking about the wellness center and how they have dedicated meditation rooms and reflection rooms. And so I think it's really cool that Denison has really backed this initiative. Um, and it's, it's, I'm excited to see how it continues to grow on campus. Um, um, but, but finally, I just wanted to say as well that I think mindfulness is still very present in my life. Um, I think um, as Dr. Matthew said, I'm in Chicago now and I just graduated in May. So a lot of life transitions and I think, um, having taken this this program and studied mindfulness and knowing that there are scientifically backed um, supported um, benefits to it I it's been so helpful for me in this transition um, and also it's important in my job as well um, I feel like you know working with teammates and, and working with um, other professionals it's been nice to kind of not take on other people's stress and keep a clear mind um, in communicating with others um, and so I just wanted to say that, you know, mindfulness is definitely something that didn't leave once I left Denison. I'm still um, very um, dependent upon it, honestly. So, um, yeah, I think that if, if you all are interested, you should definitely participate and uh, learn more about it. And the Mindfulness Club is a great resource as well um, on campus. So, yeah. yeah. Sullivan, thank you. Thank you for that overview. First, before we go any further, can we have a nice round of applause on Zoom? Um, maybe you can give us a thumbs up or something along those lines. Uh, we'll, we'll all see that. Uh, I see the applause coming in. So Sullivan, that was wonderfully done. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank just you. For, for all that. You can see the um, all the applause coming in. So thanks for that. Uh, Sullivan talked about how mindfulness was important to her because she's going through these transitions as we all do when we come out of college, right? We, we land our first job. Sometimes it's also not only a new environment, the new job, but sometimes a different geographic location, a whole new set of folks. And it's making me think of something that a fellow faculty member said just a couple of weeks ago, Sullivan, we were welcoming the class of 2026. And the chair of the faculty this year is Dr. Heather Poole from the Department of uh, Politics and Public Affairs. And she had a, a great saying to the class of 2026. She said, let me tell it to you straight, college is a roller coaster ride. And then she said, spoiler alert, and so is the rest of your life. And, and what's great about mindfulness is that it helps us cope. It doesn't stop the ups and downs. Those are going to be in the real environment, but it does help us cope. So you've laid the groundwork for that really nicely. Um, so while we're uh, transitioning into the discussion period, I invite people to, uh, um, to unmute, uh, or maybe you want to put a question into the chat if that's more comfortable for you. Um, we can do either of those. Um, I would love to hear from the audience. Anybody would like to unmute? Can I jump in really quickly? Jack, please. Thank you. I was hoping you would. Yeah, awesome. Um, thank you so much, Sullivan. Uh, really appreciate this research. And um, I can't wait to um, use it as justification to continue to encourage Koru here at Denison. Uh, while you were speaking, I ran down the hallway and there were uh, 10 students engaged in Koru with Susie um, at, just during this presentation. So for all the students listening, please continue to um, engage. We'll be repeating that series the first four Tuesdays of every month. Um, um, but also just uh, speaking to the research a little bit, I was looking at some of the outcomes measures and one um, piece within health promotion literature right now is talking about the socio-ecological model and how we can create spaces um, 
for students to connect, uh, connect with one another. And I wasn't sure if there was anything in the literature around Kuru helping students to connect with the natural environment or the social environment or, or things outside of those individual internal constructs as well. Yeah, I know that's a great point to bring up. And um, I think part of the program itself, it's, it's designed to be a group therapy, group mindfulness-based kind of um, experience. And so I think that in itself is kind of um, a sense of belonging and, and people are encouraged to come and participate in all four of those sessions to kind of keep that sense of like, um, to keep it coherent and keep that sense of belonging within all of the peers um, within. So I think that kind of in itself um, highlights like the importance of the community aspect of it. I mean, even though it's only four weeks, um, I feel like I, I grew closer to the people who were in, um, in my group. Um, and then I don't remember um, if we looked at any measures specifically, um, I can look um, into that as well. But um, I do agree that I, we did focus on individual and that would be very interesting to kind of think about the more like group um, sense of belonging aspects as well. So. That's a great question from Jack and a, a great response from Sullivan. If I can build on that and pick up on Jack's question a little bit and, and just run with something that we did at Denison, uh, probably within a week or two of Sullivan's graduation, this was still May of this past year, uh, this current year, 2022. Um, so some of the people who are on the call joined me uh, over on the west side of Denison's campus. We have a relatively new structure that we call the Moonies. <laughs> the Moonies is kind of like an all-purpose facility and we can have meetings in there and so forth. Well, we had a mindfulness retreat there. And so Jack was asking a little bit about the environment and, and the environment can be the social environment, the people that you're with. And Sullivan's pointed out that you can be with a certain number of folks for these four weeks. Um, we also were looking out over uh, some of the gorgeous trees and uh, almost forest-like areas of Denison's campus. So even though we were on campus, we felt like we were kind of in the woods. And the, the Moonies have these huge, almost garage doors that open up. And we just had this spectacular view of the green rolling hills uh, of, of the, the Welsh Hills. Um, and it was a terrific place to, to have our retreat. And I never thought, you know, a couple of years ago that I would be on a three day mindfulness retreat. Um, but what a what a release it was to try to make a commitment to get away from social media and emails for three days in a row um, or maybe it wasn't 72 hours, but it might have been close to 36 hours that actually touched at least nominally on three days uh, and it felt good to do that. Of course, it really helps when school has just ended and you're not teaching classes. I wouldn't I wouldn't attempt to do that during the semester. But once we had a, you know, a clean break from the semester, it was great to do that and feel like we were in touch with each other and also in touch with nature. So I hope that speaks a little bit to Jack's question and uh, look forward to having I'm looking forward to having more mindfulness retreats on campus and elsewhere. So let's see if we have anybody else who would like to unmute and make a comment or ask a question. Please don't be shy. Yeah, I'd uh, like to ask a question. Uh, is my audio coming through? Yeah, okay. You're good. Man. Uh, so just uh, out of curiosity, the, the graphs that you showed, are those one sigma error bars on the on the Koru? Um, let me let me go back and look. Um, to be completely honest with you, it's been two years since I uh, sure. <laughs> since I looked at this. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen again. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm don't think so. I don't. I don't know. I'm so sorry. I feel embarrassed okay. to say I don't remember no at this moment. I don't know, if, Dr. Matthews, I, if you could help me out. I don't. Sure. Sure. So. Uh, what I'll say is that most of my physics friends refer to the standard deviation as the sigma, and uh, some of ah. my psychology friends do, friends do that. Okay, so so a question can arise as to whether or not the the error bars for for the audience that might not be um, into Psych 200, which is our research methods and stats class, you get these little um, almost like T shaped things on on these error uh, on these uh, graphs, and they they tell you something about. Um, sort of like the confidence that you might have that the actual value that you're measuring uh, is, is in this range. Uh, and so you can use something called a standard deviation. You can use something called a standard error. You can use something called a confidence interval. So the error bars um, can take different forms. I actually don't know uh, which ones you and Dr. Weiss chose for this particular one, but it's an interesting yeah. question because, yeah. 
Yeah, I, no, thank you. I for... apologize. I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> uh, so no. I get the physics, the physics. Uh, so usually like one sigma would be 68% confidence. That was just a. Right, 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 right. right. Um, um, another. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, you're fine. I'm just say I have the article pulled up right now. I'm going to I'm going to look at that really quickly. Um, I, I would assume at a minimum it would be one one sigma or 68 percent, but then you know, different yeah. fields have different thresholds for discovery. Yeah. And, and, uh, so it says it says here um, air bars reflect 95 percent confidence interval. OK, 95 percent confidence interval. OK, okay. so um, so the group was relatively cautious, right? They're, they're giving us sort of broad error bars. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. Another yeah, follow, Michael, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. So, so the other thing is, um, you know, I really appreciated this. Uh, you know, challenges are also opportunities. So, I, you know, having COVID affect the world as it did uh, might bring something like mindfulness to the to the forefront. Um, and and these techniques that you mentioned are very real. I mean, Navy SEALs use box breathing before missions. You know, so this is something that it, it really works. Um, my question is. If you're if you get into the mindfulness track, is there any correlation studies, or it might be too early in the literature, to how um, that would lean towards maybe diversity and inclusion? If you're not judging yourself, mm -hmm. then maybe you're less likely to judge others. And um, has there is that too early in in the scheme of things to to look at kind of a correlation study with that, or or has that been done? Um, I personally haven't come across that, but that is something so important and I think it would be really interesting to kind of investigate. Um, I don't know, Dr. Matthews or Dr. Tim Parker, if you have, yeah. <laughs> I'll let, maybe Dr. Tim Parker is aware of that. Yeah, maybe no, not. actually in a, in a our research methods class last semester, we looked at a study. Um, I hate to be the, the bringer of bad news, <laughs> Um, but there was some interesting um, uh, interactions between, so we talk about individuals, uh, you can have either a sort of individualistic mindset or a collectivistic mindset, you know, culturally. And it turned out that mindfulness training, not, you know, they were, they were using a different program. So, you know, it's, how, it's hard to know exactly how it would translate. But for individuals who are already very individualistic, it actually led them to be less, they became more, I guess, way to think about it, self-centered. They thought less about other people than they did about themselves following the mindfulness training. People who had more of a collectivistic um, asp, you know, mindset to begin with seemed to be more willing to uh, open up and be more, think about their relation to other people more. Which is interesting because I, I mean, I had a question kind of about how, I mean, that, that's one study. In, in, and as you know, one study can be interpreted a lot of different ways, as put in the context of a lot of different studies. Um, but I was trying to think about how this extends, how we're able to generalize this. I mean, and, and the place like Denison, students, you know, um, are diverse in a number of different ways, but they come, they're in a very similar environment, very similar experiences, very similar kind of, um, uh, kind of outlook on life in a lot of ways, you could say. Um, and mindfulness seemed to work well at Denison, but how well does it extend and where do we need to be careful um, um, that we're making assumptions that's going to work or help everyone? That's the kind of question I I was thinking about. But yeah, I, I don't know, Mike, if that kind of hits on a little bit on what you're asking or so it's the less less happy side of it, I guess. <laughs> well, at least it does no harm, right? I mean, if you're if you're uh, already um, kind of aligning yourself as being a, you know, internal versus external, maybe that just uh, is a, you know, discriminant that that follows through. But, um, but excellent presentation, Sullivan. Thank you. Great question, Mike. Let's see if we have other questions or comments or um, points of conversation. So many things to talk about. Yeah. Hi, uh, Sullivan. Thank you for the great presentation and for the wonderful research and putting, you know, Denison on the map on mindfulness research, also revealing how much, um, you know, this intense month of training can, can, can make such a difference, you know, as, you know, other studies probably like do the MBSR and the, the longer program. So it's so great to see how, 
even a month, it's, it's make, it makes such a difference. Um, and I'm asking this as somebody who's not a psychologist. So I wonder um, how, what is, um, how would you talk about the difference between anxiety and, and stress? I see that um, there's graphs for, for one and then the other. Um, and I don't know if you, if you want to share anything about um, in terms of examples from, from your life or from the life of your peers at the time to, to kind of distinguish between those two, that would be, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been a while since I've taken the Psych 100, but I please correct me if I'm wrong about these definitions, but I believe anxiety is more of a, and like concern about like future events, kind of like thinking about what could potentially transpire. And then stress is more of like a present feeling. Um, it's, it's what I remember. Um, I don't know if um, one of the professors can help me out there. Um, oh, right, yeah, I mean, I get the question cleaner. for anybody who can jump in. I'm going to... Um... Back that I, I think Sullivan's description is about as good as I can get it. Um, my problem is that I'm actually a neuroscientist and I, I'm not a clinician. Uh, so, um, but but here's Jack. Maybe Jack can bail us out. We we really could use a clinician at this point. None of this psychophysics stuff. I, I measure the number of photons that are coming off of the screen right now. So stress and anxiety. You know, I'm just looking forward to the next to the next show on the moon is. Uh, so maybe Jack can help us out. Well, I guess as the resident therapist in the room, um, uh, I'll field that one. For us, anxiety is a, a diagnosis within the DSM-5. Um, and so that means that it is um, um, any kind of somatic response leading to the point of uh, impaired functioning in someone's daily life, uh, where stress is every day and um, um, something that we're always kind of uh, experiencing. Um, but then when we're unable to cope with those, um, or not cope, but um, integrate or understand how to address some of those stressors that come up, that's when it leads to more anxiety. Um, worrying being the cognitive state of uh, being thinking about the future a lot of times. So, but again, um, there's a lot of different theories and thoughts around this too. So that's just how I kind of, the lens I come at it from. That's great, Jack. Thank you. It's so so nice to have somebody from Denison's Wellness Center here talking about this. We're we're seeing uh, wellness. We're seeing mindfulness as a component of wellness increasingly on our campus, and I might guess it's it's on other college campuses too. So uh, really great to have that. If I can build on Dr. Hella Luke's point earlier, um, I appreciated that she was thanking uh, Sullivan for putting Denison uh, on the map with some of this scientific research. So I mentioned that I was going through the Koru instructor training and I'm a, a good portion of the way there. I'm not through with it yet. When I was taking the course, and, and the course is run by a psychiatrist whose name is Holly Rogers uh, at Duke University. So the Koru Center is at Duke University and they have a, a really good team there of psychologists and psychiatrists that are doing this. And during the Koru instructor training, they every so often will take a pause and say, here's some scientific research on that. And I think the very first one that they showed was Sullivan's article with Dr. Weiss and, uh, and Tema Cohen. So um, your, your work is actually training the trainers. Uh, they're, they're showing, and they're, they're offering your work as, uh, as something to um, that the instructors can point to. If somebody says, "Well, does this really does this really work?" Uh, somebody here made a reference to MBSR, and many folks in our audience will know that, but others in our audience might not know MBSR, which is mindfulness based stress reduction. And um, uh, that term is something you'll hear pretty frequently. And we find even in core sessions that uh, some of the students and, and teachers will use that phrase and not everybody is aware of it. Um, but for those of us that are interested in stress reduction, I think um, we, we get a, a really nice look at what that research might be like by seeing what Sullivan has had to offer. I wonder if I can ask Sullivan if she can, uh, I don't know Sullivan if you had any experiences. So at some point you and Tema and Dr. Weiss uh, were drafting the manuscript. And then at some point it goes off into no person's land and it goes into this place of peer review. Um, it, I don't know if you were connected to that process, but I'd be very interested. Uh, not a lot of undergraduates get to have a peer-reviewed science publication during their time 
as an undergraduate. So congratulations on that. Um, did you have any any experiences with the peer review process that you'd like to share or maybe you weren't so connected to it? Um, no, absolutely. Thank you so much. That's really kind of you to say. And um, I you know, would like to thank, obviously, Tema was you know, a great research partner and Dr. Weiss was so great um, and a mentor throughout this whole process. Um, but in terms of the, the peer review, um, I was, um, Dr. Weiss kind of handled most of it, but I was, um, you know, CC'd or forwarded emails in which we had um, the paper sent back. Um, and I will say that I was surprised at how particular that they were about you know wording and periods and this and that it was it was very very um interesting at how um they were very particular and wouldn't let us off on you know this word well this kind of indicates that instead of this but I mean that's it's kind of what you have to do it's you know a published research article um but I um definitely think it got sent I don't remember how many times it got sent back but it was I think like two or three times maybe more than that um but Dr. Weiss kind of handled making those changes. Um, nothing too dramatic, but definitely a lot of like little things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great, Sullivan. I have to say that's very similar to my experience with peer review. And I'm looking around and I think I'm seeing some nodding heads. We have folks in different disciplines. We, we have folks who are in uh, clinical sciences. We have folks in physics and in psychology and in communication and several others. And I bet that the peer review process although a little bit different from field, it's always pretty rigorous, right? Uh, and um, the, the reviewers are good at picking up on our blind spots. Sometimes things make perfect sense to us and then a reviewer reads it and says, well, you know, maybe this isn't quite the right wording and does take some back and forth. So I'm glad that you had some exposure to that experience because that's that's how science is done, um, whatever the particular yeah. science is. That's how most scholarly work is done, uh, whether it's the social sciences or the humanities and so forth. Great, so I'm glad you had that. Let's see if we have some other questions uh, about any aspect of this or, or mindfulness. This is really a lot of fun. I, I was kind of curious. Um, I mean, you, you talked about Koru and there are a couple other um, things mentioned. How many different approaches to mindfulness are you aware of or sort of aspects of it? I mean, I'm kind of thinking in the sense that you were talking about before, you know, like being mindful, being in the moment, playing tennis. Um, are mm -hmm. there versions that are more body centered in the way that they um, uh, engage? I, I just was curious how why or how how different approaches to mindfulness might be if you're if you if you're aware, if anybody knows. Yeah. I mean, I know I just feel like through my research and in the mindfulness club and personal experience, people can kind of experience the state of being mindful in, in different in scenarios. And some people like ground themselves in different aspects. So like in the four Koru classes, the first one is breathing. So some people like tend to, to ground themselves and um, use their breathing as like a mindfulness tool. Whereas like the Gotha meditation, some people will tend to like, like to hear something, like hear a word and um, that will help them or like the body scan, like as you mentioned, some people prefer to have like a more of like a physical sensation um, when thinking of um, participating in mindfulness. Um, and so I think like a lot of people do guided meditations as well, um, which personally I prefer. Um, I think the, the breathing is, is really helpful, but sometimes I tend to, to know that my mind wanders. And so having like a guided meditation to walk me through and like grounding, listening to that voice is really helpful um, for me personally. And so I think it kind of depends on the individual. Um, and I know there are also some, I think um, um, maybe um, religious connotations as well in certain um, religions as well. Um, but I don't know, that's just my experience. Great question, great response. So uh, maybe picking up on that, uh, this almost certainly won't work. I don't know if you can see. It almost, it might look like a calendar that I'm showing you here. Okay, really, really small. This is on my phone. And um, because I'm a Koru instructor, I do Koru meditations each day. And the Koru app, which is a free app. Um, and by the way, we're not trying to sell Koru here. We, we actually, we, we don't have a, a financial interest in that. Um, I think the topic of mindfulness is a fascinating topic and there are so many different apps that you can get. But the Koru app comes to us through Duke University. 
And the voice that you hear doing the meditations on the Corvo app is the psychiatrist, Holly Rogers, who's one of the founders of course, she's training the trainers who are going out and almost all the trainers have a university affiliation. So Corvo was really uh, a direct attempt to try to help the college age population with this. Um, but I've got a streak going on here. I think I'm at 42 consecutive days without having missed a session, but every once in a while I forget and, and I miss. But the um, to get back to Dr. Jim Parker's question and to build on uh, Sullivan's answer, Answer. We uh, some of the meditations are very grounded in the body. Uh, others are um, asking you to take like almost an imaginary trip uh, on a guided meditation to a place that's very meaningful for you. Um, in Koru 2.0, which Sullivan alluded to in her in her presentation, they begin to focus on something called metta. Uh, which is a loving kindness meditation. And that's a you know a very different kind of awareness. And it always goes back to Mike's issue. Um, if, if you have this loving kindness meditation, might it make you more accepting of a broader range of folks maybe that have different backgrounds than you do? Right? So I think that was the, kind of the gist of Mike's question. So there are many different um, takes that we have here. And what I like about the, the Koru app is that you can kind of pick and choose and you can also set it to, I want to do a five minute meditation or a 10 minute meditation because we don't always have that much time. Uh, so lots of different ways to go with that. I'm curious to see if anybody here on the discussion tonight has used other kinds of um, mindfulness apps. There are many of them, right? Many different mindfulness apps. We, we happen to be talking about Kuru tonight, but uh, maybe somebody can share their experiences or maybe even Sullivan has used something other than Kuru. I don't know. Um, yeah, I've used the Calm app. Um, I think um, as a part of being like a, a mindfulness fellow, we um, the, we were able to get a subscription to the Calm app. Um, and so that was really cool to have unlimited access to um, like meditations. And I use them a lot for sleeping. Like if I'm having trouble sleeping to listen um, to a guided meditation before I go to sleep. And then there have different ones designated for, for sleep or anxiety um, or, or stress. Um, so it's really cool to have um, different meditations for different um, feelings and experiences. Um, I don't know if anyone else has used any other apps as well. Um, I'm a big app user. I use the 10% Happier, um, which speaking of sleep has a lot of sleep meditations as well. And um, I'm going to draw a parenthesis from the other one that I use, which is the Plum Village meditation made by the monks and nuns at the Plum Village um, meditation, uh, I guess, community in, in France. Um, and I'm saying that because, you know, that that is grounded in the Buddhist tradition uh, of Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese monk. Um, and I did appreciate in your article how you ended by citing uh, Pema Chodron. Um, at the end and kind of recognize that sort of lineage that 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 mindfulness kind of you know through many paths comes comes from um and uh yeah i just i just love that <laughs> in in the article uh you don't often see an academic article uh citing so beautifully um this uh the teacher right of meditation that Pema Chodron is so um I just want to appreciate that before uh, closing in. Thank you so much. That's really kind. Thank you. Uh, Alina, thank you for I, that. Um, I wanted yeah. to make a comment too. Um, thank you for the presentation. And um, I think there's a lot of questions that kind of have something to do with each other um, that I wanted to mention, which is, I think the most basic form of mindfulness in the Buddhist tradition is almost non-conceptual to the point where a guided form of it would kind of impede the, the simplest form, the purest form. It's also kind of a little dangerous sometimes too, because some people, um, if they're not regulated, um, have issues with trauma, things like that, that can be a problem. So guided meditation is a lot of times a great entryway. But um, to, the, to the point, uh, Dr. Chin Parker's point about um, people becoming more individualized, if that's where their tendency is, um, the Buddhist progression in, in the Tibetan tradition, which I come from, uh, starts with a non-conceptual approach and then moves towards conceptuality, not unlike what I think I'm hearing with the Kuru program. So you kind of start working with your own mind and then you return to conceptuality with a new view, you know, a more productive view. 
So you, you're, you've built a stronger understanding of how you project your judgments, how you um, cling to things in your mind. And so you need to start by kind of retracting and abandoning, and then you can re-engage with practices like metta or Tonglen in the Tibetan tradition. Um, so I think that's maybe a little bit of an answer to a couple of those questions, I hope. Thank you so much for sharing. Adam, thank you. And thank you for, for leading us. Uh, Adam was part of our retreat. Uh, and came in and, and did a wonderful session for us back in May when we had our faculty retreat for mindfulness. So, so nice to see you uh, here. Um, I'm, welcoming, I'm welcoming other folks to turn on a mic and, and share something. And, and while they're doing that, I'm going to drop a couple of links into the chat for those people who might be interested. One of the links will be to the Koru resources that are free and available to everybody. And there are some meditations there that you might find interesting. Another one is here at Denison. Early on, to get the mindfulness rolling at Denison, we hired a consultant. Uh, her name is Linnea Pine. And Linnea comes to us from UCLA. She was part of the UCLA Mindfulness Resource Awareness Center uh, and or Mindfulness Research uh, Awareness Center. And uh, I'm going to drop in that Mark uh, um, uh, link so that you can go right to the UCLA link and you can get a whole bunch of guided meditations there and see some of the research that's going on at UCLA on mindfulness. So I'll put those in and I invite other people to, uh, to offer a comment or a question uh, any way that they like. Uh, I just wanted to, to answer Jack's question about um, conferences. Um, so no, as of now, I don't have any future um, conferences to present uh, the research, but I did, I was able to present uh, virtually at the uh, Midwestern Psychological Association Conference and then the um, Psychi Conference, um, which is the um, Honor Society in Psychology. So that was really cool um, back my junior year. Um, although it was virtual, it was really cool to attend. Um, but as of now, unfortunately, I, I don't have any other um, future conferences, but would love to do that and I'm very interested so I guess I'll add one more thing since um this meeting is is kind of mindfulness and and um, psychology coming together uh, one of the resources that I discovered recently was this book called um love 2.0 uh that one um I think a psychologist wrote, uh, and the meta meditation reminds me of it, right? Uh, I think the name is Barbara Fredrickson, and I don't know if that rings a bell to uh, Dr. Matthews or Seth Chin Parker, um, but um, yeah, it 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 brings up that comes up again for me as well. Thank you. So many resources, and I appreciated that uh, Dr. Hill Luke had shared with us the 10% Better, right, uh, which is actually a great book, and um, it was recommended during one of the mindfulness sessions. I'm trying to think, uh, there was a newscaster who wrote that book, 10% um, Better, I'm trying to think uh, what that, that name was, um, but he's a really fun writer. And um, what I liked about it was just the modesty of his claim. He wasn't claiming it's going to solve everything. And sometimes people get a little carried away with all the things mindfulness can do. He was only hoping that it could make things 10% better. And I thought that was an interesting way of framing his approach to mindfulness. 10% happier. Thank you, Dan Harris. Yeah. Something else. I, I had put a question in the chat that I think was touched on already uh, about the potential convergence or overlap with uh, mindful, uh, mindfulness techniques and, and thinking with uh, Eastern philosophy or kind of some of the gurus that you see on, on TikTok um, that have some, some cool ways of thinking. Yeah. So, you know, what I find so interesting about this, Mike, is uh, as I've come into different folks who um, who work with mindfulness, um, there are some different approaches. I think that the folks in Koru 
uh, will we'll, uh, very honestly acknowledge that many of these ideas originate from the Buddhist tradition, as Sullivan alluded to. Uh, absolutely. You know, that's where some of the, the intellectual foundations are. The folks at Kuru and Duke University are um, quite firm that, uh, although they're very grateful for those intellectual roots, uh, they see Kuru as a very secular uh, endeavor. Um, but others don't take it that way. They, they take mindfulness as being something that is fundamentally rooted in, in Buddhism. And they, they feel that um, that the secular attempts and the scientific attempts to, to move mindfulness in a different direction uh, might be something of an appropriation. You know, uh, that, uh, so so I've, I've heard people um, make arguments in both of those, those ways. Everybody's acknowledging uh, Buddhist origins, which I think is wonderful. Uh, and some folks are willing to move away from that uh, and, and say, but, you know, now this, this portion is secular and others really don't. They, they want to embrace the origins all the way on back. If I could take a stab at that too, I think um, gurus, for me, I have the most success with students when it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation over a long period of time. We're talking about their specific experiences, their specific doubts, like that guy at work, you know, like that kind of stuff. And so I think that a lot of times, to me, that's kind of what I see the guru relationship. They may talk to a thousand people, but whether they're effective or not, to me, comes down to like, how do they work in guiding a student, an individual student through their practice, which also is is ripe for a, a potential dangerous relationship too. You know, so that's a, you know, be really careful kind of scenario. Um, but I do think that's really important. So that's one thing I kind of um, am curious about with the CORA program, because it's only through repeated individual meetings that I've seen the most success with students. So I hope that there's an, an element of that, you know. Adam, thank you. I'm mindful of the time, and I appreciate that many of you have things to do at eight o'clock. Uh, there are children that have to be put to bed, and uh, some of us are going to need to get a good night's sleep because we've got class early in the morning. Um, so let me thank Sullivan again, and could we have a nice round of applause by Zoom for Sullivan and putting this together? Sullivan, thank you. Such a pleasure. So nice to see one of our recent alums visiting us again. And just a quick reminder that we're going to be back on Tuesday, October 11 at 7 p.m. here on Zoom, and we're going to be talking about INSTEP, the program that Drum Corps International has as an initiative for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we hope to see you next week, uh, next month, October 11 at 7 p.m. Uh, the Zoom coordinates, as always, through the Granville Public Library. Good night, everybody.